Welcome back, everyone. We are talking about investigations of more about the food product health claims that are valid in Canada. And over the past uh, series of videos, we've talked about the fact that Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency have very clear guidance about what can and can't be said on food product labels. And so oftentimes, uh, food companies want to say, oh, well, eating this food will cure the hiccups or eating this food will prevent this disease or um, right now one that's very popular is being able to make statements about immunity and eating this food will improve my immune function and uh, prevent COVID. That level of making a claim is something that uh, you have to be really, really aware about and there are some very clear pieces of information in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. So we're going to walk through that today. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to understand the types of claims used in Canada for food products, including disease reduction, risk reduction claims, therapeutic claims, function claims, nutrient function claims, probiotic claims, and prebiotic claims. We will use the conditions and tables to evaluate how to properly validate and phrase claims properly. We'll review the novel health claims assessments. And we'll apply general health statements and implied health claims appropriately for food products. Because there are uh, some general things that you can say as long as you're being very particular and careful about it. So let's dig right in. Now we are working from the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. And those of you who are taking the course at Niagara College are at this point likely well acquainted with it. But if this is uh, something that you're watching from out in the community, I do highly recommend you look up the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry and watch some of the other videos to make sure you understand what the guide is able to do and what sort of information is provided within it. But um, we are going to be working through the industry labeling tool and working on the health claims tab. And in a moment, I'll jump out there and find it with you. But just a quick reminder, under the Food and Drugs Act, under Section 3, no person shall advertise any food, drug, cosmetic, or device to the general public as a treatment, preventative, or cure for any of the diseases, disorders, or abnormal, abnormal physical states. And so what does that imply? It just implies that we have to be very, very particular about how we can state any sort of health or nutrition benefit from a food product and be very, very deliberate about it. And in a moment, we'll talk about Schedule A diseases, but uh, uh, there's not supposed to be a line there. It's just a formatting thing. But uh, Section 5 of the Food and Drugs Act, no person shall label, package, treat, process, sell, or advertise any food in a manner that is false, misleading, or deceptive, or is likely to create an erroneous impression regarding its character, value, quantity, composition, merit, or safety. And so this is another scenario that is really important with respect to nutrition uh, and health claims in that you've got to make sure that your facts are all lined up and that anything that you are saying is, is going to be truthful and not misleading about the, the capabilities that that food product is going to deliver. I, I always joke and say, well, one of my, my imaginary health claims that I always want to do is this food will cure the hiccups. I, every time I eat bread, I get the hiccups, and I'd love to find a cure for the hiccups. Um, but uh, in a, we have to have absolute solid evidence to be able to make those sorts of claims. And I know oftentimes uh, I work with small businesses, and they'll say, well, I read a research paper, and it said um, banana peels cures the hiccups, therefore I want to put that on my label just reading one paper or reading one blog post or reading one um, document is not going to be conclusive evidence. If you are going about that sort of investigation where you are trying to substantiate something new that's not in this document, you can't just go and say, oh, well, one paper is sufficient to justify this. Nope, there's a much more extensive process and we'll talk about that briefly. So. This is what this slide that looks super wordy, but one of the clear things that's repeated time and time and time and time again is that you cannot on any food product make 
any sort of substantiation with respect to what they call a Schedule A disease. And this list is pretty long and I'm not going to read it out for you, but I have a slide here where I've highlighted a couple diseases in this list. And, and this is important to note. So first off, you cannot make any claims with respect to acute infectious respiratory syndromes. So for example, there have been small businesses that I've talked to recently where they're like, oh, well, you know what? We think that we'd like to be able to position this because it's good against COVID. And they're like, nope, that's a Schedule A disease. COVID is an infectious respiratory syndrome. And therefore, you cannot make any statement of claim with respect to COVID on your food product. Uh, some other ones, uh, some certain diseases that are very diet related. So diabetes, hypertension, and obesity are, are diseases that are very much uh, correlated to diet, and you can't make any specific statement of claim. So, for example, with respect to obesity, you can't go about and say this eating this food will help you lose weight or help overcome obesity unless it's a very specifically regulated food. And we'll talk about this in another video, um, which is not a food but an actual meal replacement, uh, a meal replacement product. And as such, then it is regulated differently from a nutrition perspective, but it can, then can have weight loss oriented claims. You can't just put it on any type of food that you want. Same with diabetes. You can't say this is a food that's low in glycemic index or will improve your outcome for um, diet related diabetes. Hypertension, same deal. You can't say this eating this food will reduce your blood pressure. The other two that are interesting, dementia and depression. There's, there's uh, as we know, dementias like um, Alzheimer's disease are, ex uh, they're be becoming more and more prevalent in our aging society here in Canada. And as such, there's a lot of interest in finding uh, diets and, and food systems that are going to either reduce the risk of dementia or improve outcomes of dementia. And you can't say anything about that specifically. Um, same with depression. Right now, there are lots of different food products that are trying to make sort of adaptogenic claims and say uh, enhances your mood or improves your emotional state. You can't say anything about depression or um, emotional states. Um, and so any claims of that sort are very, very um, easy to challenge from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So these are what are called the Schedule A diseases and they are listed in the Food and Drugs Regulation. Um, there are some general requirements pretty much from every health claim that's out there. And the first one is that there is typically for almost all of the claims that you can make in Canada, there is what is called a prescribed warning. And I'll show you in a moment that there are these tables for each of the different types of claims and you have to use the prescribed wording. You can't just go and make up your own words. You can't just go and say it the way you want to say it. You have to use the prescribed wording. And the nice thing is that prescribed wording has to be in English and French. But if you flip the language, the official language, you can find the parallel statement in French so you know what that prescribed wording needs to be. Second one, the food must meet the compositional criteria for that claim. And so there's a reason that we've spent the first half of this class digging into using ESHA and being able to make nutrition facts tables because oftentimes you, you need to have a really clear sense of what is in your food product on a per serving basis. So again, we've talked a lot about how do you define a serving size for your product based off of the, the table of reference serving sizes and based off of the... Uh, the uh, portion size within that package and based off of the household measure relevant to that package. But you have to meet a compositional criteria for the claim. And so sometimes it means that you have to have so many grams of uh, a certain ingredient or it has to meet the uh, capability of making a source of claim or an excellent source of claim based off of a nutrient content claim. But there are clear compositional criteria that most of the health claims require. And last but not least, the label or advertisement must state the specific information required for that claim. So let's say, for example, you wanted to make a claim that, um, I don't know, that coarse wheat bran improves laxation. You would have to state on there that 
you have all of the specific information. So you must eat so many grams of coarse wheat bran to fulfill this claim. It becomes a bit awkward. And so there's a reason why there's a lot of regulation behind this in that everything needs to be clear and mis not misleading and with a very strong evident evidence background. But at, this, at the same time, there's um, having all this regulation allows for an even, even playing field. The, where the inequality occurs is that people don't realize that they could be going into the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry and reading up and digging into the regulation to understand exactly what can and can't be said. So often the regulations are seen as being opaque and that people don't understand where to find the information. That's why we're making these YouTube videos, to help you out. So we've covered the general requirements here. Oh, I had highlighted. So again, just to reiterate, you have to use the prescribed wording, you have to meet the compositional criteria, and you have to put the specific information that's found in each of these tables so that that specific information is in your label or on your end, any advertising material that you're using. Now, let's jump into some of these claims, and I'm actually going to flip back and forth between the uh, PowerPoint and the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. And so, again, if you haven't watched the video about the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, I highly recommend you watch that so you understand uh, some of the information that's there. But first, let's start with disease reduction claims. And a disease reduction claim implies that if you are consuming a certain food, um, that food is going to help reduce the risk it's not going to eliminate it, but it's going to help reduce the risk of a certain disease. And here's an example of one. A healthy diet with adequate calcium and vitamin D and regular physical activity will help to achieve strong bones and may reduce the risk of osteoporosis. Naming this food, maybe it's milk, is an excellent source of calcium. You have to use, if you remember the, the cardinal rules, you have to meet the prescribed wording. This is the prescribed wording. Let's jump out and take a look at disease reduction claims in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. I have pre-highlighted all these wonderful tabs. I'm gonna close that one. So here we go, acceptable disease reduction claims and their therapeutic claims. So as you know, I'm in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry and I'm in the health claims section on food labels. So. Acceptable disease reduction claims. So some general overall rules. I'm going to let you read this on your own, but I'm going to just jump out and highlight some of the, the top level important elements here. So you have to meet the compositional criteria and you have to meet the labeling and advertising requirements. It's listed in a table here. So as I mentioned before, what's really clever is for most of the different health claims, they have established some tables that help summarize all the information that you have to have. So you have to use that prescribed wording, you have to meet the compositional requirement, and you must state the specific information. So let's take a look at an example here. Here's a disease risk reduction claim with respect to sodium and potassium. So let's read this out. A healthy diet containing foods high in potassium and low in sodium may reduce the risk of high blood pressure, a risk factor for stroke and heart disease. Naming this food is sodium free. So maybe it's, um, I don't know, perhaps it's crackers. This, the crackers that you formulated are sodium free. It would have to imply that that food other than a fruit and uh, other than a vegetable or fruit does, it meets all of the conditions in column two for low in energy and contains at least 10% of the weighted recommended nutrient intake for vitamins and minerals and, and nutrients. So you've got to be able to make one of those uh, nutrient content claims per reference serving amount and reference of state er, of serving reference stated size. And it meets the low and saturated fatty acids statement. It contains less than 0.5% alcohol and it meets the free of sodium Summary. So it's not that it's just it's free of sodium, but you have to make all of these other claims to be able to make this substantiated claim. And there's a reason why you don't see these claims very often, besides the fact that the wording is extremely awkward and lengthy to be able to make the claim. You have to meet all of those conditions. You can't just meet one of them. You have to meet all of them. So it, it's it just carries on. It just carry, it, you have to have, if you're making this the potassium part of the claim, you have to have 350 milligrams or more of potassium 
per reference data size and so on. And the thing is, if you're going to make any of these claims, you've got to read through the table to make sure that you are fulfilling all of those conditions for the food. And then there is that condition for the label. So the label has to be, um, if it's made on the label or in an advertisement, you have to um, make sure that the amount of sodium and potassium per serving is in accordance with the, the regulations. And it doesn't apply if it's on a fresh fruit or vegetable. And if you are making this sort of claim, if you are in a product that is otherwise exempted, you now have to make a nutrition facts table. So this is where that level of complexity increases. Now, how about some disease risk reduction claims with respect to calcium and vitamin D? Here's one, a healthy diet with adequate calcium, vitamin D and regular physical activity help to achieve strong bones and may reduce the risk of osteoporosis, naming this food as a good source of calcium. And those in column one are the things that you can say about calcium and vitamin D. So you can say things about foods that are high in calcium, and then you have to fulfill all of the components in column two in terms of the percentage of all those different uh, components within that food product. And then you have to fulfill all of the components within column three. And so while it's, it's very wordy, you do need to go through and read it. I'm not going to read it all for you. Um, how about uh, risk reduction claims with respect to saturated and trans fat? That's another class that's in here. You can do risk reduction claims with respect to cancer risk reduction. And you're like, you're likely saying, wait a second, we were just told that we couldn't make any, th any claims with respect to class A diseases. Well, we're not, we're not curing cancer. We're reducing the risk of cancer. And we saw up in the other section about sodium and potassium, we were dealing with hypertension. Well, you can't just go out and say, reduces blood pressure. You have, you have to work within the substantiated claims that are allowed. And in this case, this is one of those substantiated claims that is allowed. You can't just go out and say blood pressure, blood pressure, pressure. Here we're, we're sort of, it's, it seems like it's um, a double standard, but no, it, this is just the way it is and you need to be aware of it. So we've got all of these different disease risk reduction claims. Now we've got one with respect to heart disease and risk reduction and eating a healthy diet rich in a variety of vegetables and fruit may reduce the risk of heart disease. How about a disease risk reduction claims with respect to dental caries? So eating this will not cause cavities or will not promote tooth decay. You likely have seen it on certain sugar-free chewing gums. And so to be able to do it, you also, and this is another one of those also, you have to also then fulfill the leg legibility, the bilingual labeling requirements, and you have to have the nutrition facts table if you're going to make the claim other than on fresh fruits and vegetables without any other added ingredients. Any of these claims triggers the requirement for a nutrition facts table. And we've stated it before, you have to use the exact wording of the permitted disease reduction claim. And so you can't put numbers, words, or symbols in there to manipulate that. Um, so you can't put any intervening information in there. And so that naming of the food, it has to be a, it can be a brand name, but it also has to accompany a common name. So you can now understand why, why it's, it's uh, messy. You can't just put your brand name in there. So let's say you are making a breakfast cereal. You can't just say cereal you have to put in the brand name and the common name of that product. And it gets better. <laughs> That's just the disease reduction claim. So let's jump back and remind ourselves, what's the next one that we're working on? So again, uh, if you're making a disease reduction claim, you do need to go through and read it. Let's take a look. Oh, food function claims. So these are specifically for Three core ingredients are pre-approved, and then there is scientific research. Just like with the list of incorporation, there are now additional lists where they're going about. So three of the three of the ingredients are enshrined in the Food and Drugs Regulation, and then the rest of them are in the lists of approved in, um, 
food function claims. So let's jump out there. But it, right now it's coarse wheat bran, green tea, and psyllium that are in the food and drug regulation. And you have to, again, follow that prescribed wording. So naming this size serving of this product provides <coughs> so much fiber from psyllium seed, consuming 3.5 grams of fiber from psyllium seed daily promotes regularity. And you're like, yay, wow, that's, that's really wordy to be able to say that uh, this product makes you regular and increases uh, your bowel movements. Um, <laughs> let's jump out and take a look. So we were looking at uh, function claims. They used to be called structure function claims. So as we mentioned before, we have some conditions. You can't make drug representations. You do have to fulfill the language requirements. If you are making a function claim, you have to have a nutrition facts table. You do have to have that quantitative statement. So you have to make sure that you are fulfilling the quantity that's necessary. And there are a few examples where you can make the claim but not have it there. So for example, if the quantity is far less, then you can make a clear declaration. There is the scientific research section and again, it's not that, oh, I read one paper and therefore I've done scientific research. No, you have to show a comprehensive literature review and then send it in for pre-approval from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Health Canada to have that uh, approval done. So that, and, the, and then the challenge is that that approval is not specific just to your company. The moment that you have that approval, any other company can use that same uh, research to advance their claims as well. So there's a whole burden of evidence and a whole burden of what the physiologic effect has to be to be able to prove a newly researched claim. So there are, there are descriptions of what defines a really good claim. And so there are very specific claims that can be stated in this, in this format. So these are some of the claims that are coming from the scientific research component, and it has to be extremely specific and cannot be just vaguely put out there. Now, here are the ones that are enshrined within the food and drugs regulation. So, coarse wheat bran, naming this serving. So, let's say it's a quarter cup of naming the products. Uh, bran flakes, bran cereal contains seven grams or more than seven grams of fiber from coarse wheat bran, which promotes laxation. And as you know, laxation means having a um, good bowel movement. <laughs> and honestly, some of these structure function claims are very, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're almost awkward to say because a lot of them just relate to regularity. Um, and again, we've got those three columns. What's the other piece of the puzzle? What are the conditions of use you have to meet? The, regular, er, the reasonable daily intake of that food product. And you have to, um, yeah, the, all, these, all these different conditions, you, you have to go through and parse through exactly what you want to be able to say. Green tea leaves, again, another one that's enshrined in FDR. So having green tea, consumption of one cup of green tea helps protect blood lipids from oxidation. And the green tea infusion has to include at least two grams or more of tea leaves per 250 mils, or one tea bag containing at least two grams of tea leaves or a reconstituted green tea product with at least 0.8 grams that would be equivalent to two grams. And you have to make a precautionary statement that if you consume more than nine cups per day, you should not, you should not because of the caffeine content. Again, you have to fulfill all of these components to be able to make that initial claim. And that is just, that's why you don't see as many claims as you think you would because it is not an easy process. You have to go through and parse through each of these elements. It's doable. It's completely and eminently doable. However, you have to have that attention to detail. Now there are additional, oh, did I have the right tab open? No, these are nutrient function claims. Which one of these? This is the science research one. So under the, um, under the function claims, there is a section on science research and they have additional, almost like a list of incorporation with a dish, ah, oh, where is it? That's not the tab I want. 
they have done what are called these health claims assessment. And these are additional um, function claims that have been approved because of the literature review that was prepared. And this could be a whole other slideshow where they talk about the guidance documents for preparing a health claim submission. But um, imagine these are the ones that have been approved and accepted. So the use of polysaccharide complexes, such as xanthan gum and sodium alginate, to uh, reduce postprandial blood glucose response. So in essence, slowing and blunting that glycemic index um, that occurs from consuming carbohydrate-rich foods. EPA and DHA, so uh, omega-3 fatty acids and triglyceride lowering, um, using different polysaccharides for reducing cholesterol, vegetables and fruit and heart disease, soy protein and cholesterol lowering. Note the dates on these. These are not that long ago that these claims were substantiated. And that's... it. it they, they, Canada realized that to be competitive within the global marketplace, they needed to open up more health claims. And these have only occurred within the past 20 years that these additional claims beyond coarse wheat bran, psyllium and green tea have been allowed to be uh, proclaimed. And so sugar-free gum and dental caries, whole flaxseed and blood cholesterol lowering, soy protein, uh, fruit, vegetables and cancer. These are claims. And again, under each of these claims, there's going to be one of those tables saying, here's exactly what you can say and how you have to structure it. And there have been claims put forward and they have been rejected. And we'll have a different slideshow on how do you go about developing an application for making a new um, function claim against a commodity group. You'll know it's all commodity oriented here. Let's jump back on my PowerPoint here before I lose my voice. So food function claims, you've covered that off. Nutrient function claims. These ones are a little bit broader, but this is where you're saying this nutrient helps do a certain function, not just it's there. So we talked about, we talked about um, making a nutrient content claim before saying this food is a good source of vitamin C, but it doesn't say anything about what vitamin C does. And that function can be added to a nutrient content claim. So let's jump out and find in our guide to, there we go, was it nutrient function claims? Yeah, there we go. So nutrient function claims, these are those well-established roles for the, uh, the nutrients within foods. And again, we those same general rules, we have no darker presentations. You have to meet the language requirements. You have to make declaration of the amount of nutrient and have a nutrition facts table that accompanies. And you have to make sure that you have appropriate quantitative um, information about the nutrients that are there. So let's jump right out there. So if you have uh, certain nutrients, so we've talked in a different video series about being able to make a source of protein claim and that source of protein claim implies that you have a PER value of at least 20. And it, to make an excellent source of protein rating claim, you have a PR or protein rating or PER value of 40. You have to be able to fulfill that on top to be able to make a general uh, nutrient function claim with respect to protein. The other ones... In terms of vitamins and, and minerals, you have to meet that minimum 5% daily value, except for in the case of vitamin C, in which um, you have to be able to make the source of claim to be able to do that. And you have to, of course, have that nutrient uh, nutrition facts table. Let's find the general nutrient, uh, nutrient function claims. Energy is a factor in the maintenance of good health. Energy is a factor in normal growth and development. Well, that's really descriptive, isn't it? Um, but honestly, these, this is the sort of fantastic stuff that you can say, and depending on how you market your product, this could be useful, but in general, it's pretty, it's pretty generic. Protein helps build and repair body tissues. Fat supplies energy. DHA and omega-3 fatty acids supports the normal physical development of the brain, eyes, and nerves, primarily in children under two years of age. There's a reason, <laughs> very, very wordy, isn't it? 
Uh, but that's the prescribed wording that is allowed for these nutrient function claims. So vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, what, what can we say about vitamin C? Vitamin C, a factor in the development and maintenance of bones, cartilage, teeth, and gums. It's a dietary oxidant. Um, so you, you can say things about antioxidant, but you, it has to be very, very deliberately done. And so in this case, it has to meet that source of vitamin C claim. And then you can make one of these substantiated uh, nutrient function claims. But only what's here. You can't go about it and say vitamin C cures the hiccups because it's not on the list. You cannot say it. And unless you are willing to go about and make that scientific justification and put in an application to Health Canada and CFIA, you can't say it. What else can what else can we say? Oh, wrong PowerPoint. So nutrient function claims. Oh, we're almost down to the end here. So probiotic claims. So we've talked about the importance of probiotics. Those are the healthy um, bacteria that are sometimes naturally occurring from fermentation. In other cases, they are added as a technical ingredient. But probiotics, in general, we've got some, some broad claims that can be made. The challenge is that the species of organism has to be on a list of organisms that's pre-approved. You cannot go about making strain-specific claims. You can't say Saccharomyces cerevisiae improves your gut health. You can't say anything specifically about the strain. You can only say generic um, therapeutic claims. So it's a probiotic that naturally forms part of the gut flora. So let's jump out and see what we can say about probiotics. So probiotic claims. Again, you have some very specific um, gen generic statements that you can say. You can say probiotics or with beneficial probiotic cultures or contains bacteria that are essential to a healthy system or you can name the microbial species. And that in its own right suggests there's a health benefit. So can you make disease risk reduction or therapeutic claims? Not exactly. There are a couple things that you can say. We, in general, we, are, we do not have strain specific claims approved. And so you can only make non-strain specific claims. That said, it has to be one of the strains on their list. So. Oh man, this goes on and on and on and on and on. And you'll understand, and again, I highly recommend if you are working with a product that wants to make these sorts of claims, you need to dig into the list and you need to read through all of this and get a broader understanding. I'm going really, really fast because I have lots of topics I need to cover, but what are some of the acceptable non-strain specific claims? So it has to be an eligible species, which it seems, again, it seems contradictory, but that's that's the rules. You have to make a non-strain specific claim. You have to have a species of probiotic that's in their table. It has to meet a minimum quantity in that food product at one, uh, one times 10 to the uh, nine. So that would be 1 billion CFUs per of one or more of the eligible or microorganisms. And so here are the organisms that are acceptable. And here's what you can say, a probiotic that naturally forms part of the gut flora or provides live microorganisms that are naturally form part of the gut flora or contributes to a healthy gut flora or contribute to a healthy gut flora. And, uh, and honestly, it's not that com compelling when you see what's here. And so something that's common, and, and, I, and I realize at this point we've sort of covered off most of the health claims, but let me just jump back to this one last slide here. There are some general things that you can say about food products, and I'm going to jump back here, and I always joke we are we are friends, and you can say some generic things like, can I say my food is healthy or my food is nutritious? So you can't make those uh, general health claims. You, you can use vignettes and logos and and I think I'll have a, another slide presentation specifically where we talk about using pictures or vig vignettes or logos or trademarks that imply healthiness and what are the rules behind that because 
uh, I know from some of the presentations people did in the early part of the semester, we kept finding things like the health, heart healthy check box from um, some of the companies or the non-GMO project symbol. What do those uh, trademark symbols mean and what are the requirements for use of those trademark symbols? So if you want to say things like it's nutritious or it's healthy, to say nutritious, it has to have at least a source of a minimum of one nutrient permitted in the nutrition facts table. So you have to make that nutrient content claim to be able to substantiate the general claim that this product is nutritious. If you want to say something is healthy, it has to comply with eating well with Canada's food guide. And it means that that, that food fits into a, a, an appropriate component of the Canada Food Guide. And as you know, the, the current Canada Food Guide is pretty pretty uh, generic and somewhat loose in its structure right now. If you want to say nutritious or healthy, you are going to lose your nutrition facts table exemption. And this is the last one that I'm going to leave you with here. If you want to make some sort of weight loss or weight maintenance claim, now you are suddenly um, infringing on Schedule A diseases, as mentioned before, and Obesity was listed in that Schedule A diseases, and therefore your food is no longer a food. It is a food for special dietary use, and it has its own regulations. And so you can't go out there and say eating this will help promote weight loss or eating this will increase your metabolism or eating this is somehow going to improve your um, outcomes for weight management that has to be then classified as a food for special dietary use. And typically they become meal replacement product. So my take home message here is the guide to food labeling for industry is your friend. And the more you read it and the more you dig into it, the more you will discover what you can and can't say about different food products. And I can't stress this enough, just take that time and study it and investigate and dig a little bit deeper. Having a high level understanding of what is in the guide to food labeling for industry will help direct you to the right section. And then you can dig deeper and make sure that any sort of claim that you want to be making against your food product is going to be compliant and therefore you will not have any regulatory issues doing, doing so. We will have some other slideshows talking about how can you prepare a challenge to what you can make for a health claim, but note that it's a long and uh, deliberate process where you have to do an extensive scientific review. So you know where to find me if you have questions. I do enjoy hearing your questions and I do have some uh, Q&A videos that I want to make that are in the hopper because I've had some great questions come in recently. Take care. Have fun with um, health claims and we'll talk to you again real soon.